This screencast is intended to teach you about combining elements into compounds. When we take a compound, what we actually have is two or more elements chemically combined in the exact combination as well as the exact proportion of elements. If we change the combination and proportion of elements, we'll actually be getting a new different compound that has different properties. For example, H2O and H2O2, they both are hydrogen and oxygen. However, we are changing the proportions in which they're combining. Hydrogen uh, is combining with oxygen uh, to create water in a ratio of two to one, whereas in hydrogen peroxide, it's a one to one ratio or two to two. Water is vital for life, whereas hydrogen peroxide is extremely toxic decomposes readily um, and it can be sped up by a, a variety of different catalysts. Water de doesn't decompose unless we apply electricity. Very different properties, um, but they're the exact same elements combining. So this goes to show that the proportion in which the elements combine is important. Whenever two, at, or whenever two elements combine into a compound, they're going to lose their original properties. For example, if I take sodium metal, a, an extremely reactive metal that would react with water, and I take chlorine gas, an extremely re reactive gas that reacts violently with metal and is very, very toxic. If I were to chemically combine these into sodium chloride and ACL, this is something I can put on my food. So I'm taking two highly reactive substances in sodium metal and chlorine gas, and I'm combining them into just table salt. Whenever we are forming uh, a compound, there are three different types of bonds or two different types of bonds that can be created. There are ionic bonds and then there are covalent bonds. When we have an ionic bond formed, what we are doing is we're combining a metal with a non-metal. When a metal and a non-metal combine to form a compound, we call that a salt. So ionic bonds create salts. Whenever we have a non-metal bonding to another non-metal, that is a covalent bond. And whenever we have a covalent bond, that's making a molecule. There are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, when we have covalent, covalent bonds, that's when we are creating molecules. There are also metallic bonds. Metallic bonds, they do not form compounds. Um, they just create, uh, we can create different mixtures of metals, but we're not creating new compounds when we combine different metals. So that would just be a metal combined with another metal. And so ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds will all have different properties that we'll learn about later. So whenever a compound forms, we're often going to get a crystal lattice. And what a crystal lattice is, is it's the three-dimensional geometric arrangement of the particles. Whenever we have ionic compounds, every negative ion is going to be surrounded by positive ions, and every positive ion is going to be surrounded by negative ions. And so ionic substances, ionic compounds will form crystal lattices as well as metals will form crystal lattices. Covalent compounds will rarely form crystal lattices, typically because they are molecules instead. So in metals, the outer energy levels of electrons overlap. And so what this does is instead of forming an ionic compound where we have ions and so cations and anions locking into place because their electrons are transferred and held as part of the ion. In metals, we just have a bunch of cations. So they're all positively charged uh, ions. And so what this causes is all the extra valence or outer energy level electrons, they get pulled together in what we call the electron C model. And so the electrons are going to be in the spaces between the cations and they're not locked into place like they would be with ionic crystals. So if I go back a slide to this picture of the sodium chloride crystal, there aren't going to be any loose electrons in that structure. All the electrons are tied up as part of um, a negative ion, the chloride ions. Whereas in metals, there's no ion that's accepting those extra electrons, so therefore they kind of just get pulled in the spaces in between. And so we call this the electron C model. Because these electrons are just in the spaces in between, they are free to move around. And so since we have these electrons are free to move around, we call them delocalized, meaning they do not have a location that is specific to them. They can move wherever they choose. And so um, this is what allows 
metals to have a lot of their unique properties like conducting electricity. And so whenever we, we talk about the attraction between the positively charged metal cations to that sea of electrons, so positive attracted to negative, that is what we call metallic bonding. And so this, if we were to look at the crystal structure of different metals, we could see that as the amount of delocalized electrons increases, so does the hardness and the strength. And so at the top left, we have large metallic crystals. At the bottom right, we have very small metallic crystals. And depending on the process of heating and cooling, we could change the size of these metallic crystals and change the arrangement of the electrons and thus ultimately determine or change and modify the hardness and the strength of that metal. So this is why uh, swordsmiths and uh, people that make knives and other types of uh, metal implements, they're going to go through the tedious process of heating that metal and cooling it slowly or rapidly depending on what properties they're going to get. Covalent compounds, on the other hand, they are going to form discrete individual molecules instead of those crystal lattices like ionic salts and metals. And so every um, combination of atoms is going to form one individual molecule that exists by itself. Um, there are other examples like diamond and graphite, which is what we would call network solids. Um, those are more like crystal lattices, uh, but for the, the purpose of this course, we're just going to be talking about covalent compounds forming individual molecules. So whenever we examine the properties, uh, the physical properties of substances, melting points and boiling points, as well as the hardness, they're going to be dependent on the strength of attraction. And so here we have a table of ionic compounds, uh, various salts, and we can see that the melting points and the boiling points of these substances are very high. It takes a lot of energy to separate those atoms such that uh, they will be able to change the phase from solid to liquid. And so that would be the melting point. Metal, melting points of metals um, generally vary greatly, but they are often very high, similar to ionic compounds. There are some examples of metals that when they melt, uh, it doesn't require very much heat at all. For example, lithium is 180 degrees Celsius. You can melt lithium. Uh, there are some metals that at or very close to room temperature, they are liquids like mercury or gallium. And so, um, like I mentioned, metal melting points vary on a very large spectrum, but generally speaking, metal melting points and boiling points are very high because of the strength of those metallic bonds. If we go to covalent substances, uh, covalent substances are very weak bonds, therefore their melting points and their boiling points are extremely low. Um, we could see that a lot of these substances like nitrogen and ammonia, their melting points are in the negatives, which tells us that at, at room temperature, uh, they are far beyond melted and you can see even their boiling points are in the negatives, which tells us that not only are they melted, but they've been boiled or vaporized and they're actually in the gas phase. So at room temperature, roughly 25 degrees Celsius, we could see that nitrogen is a gas, ammonia is a gas, um, ethanol, it doesn't take very much to heat it up to its boiling point of 78 degrees Celsius to vaporize it. Um, and the only substances that are actually solids at room temperature on this chart would be sucrose and paraffin. And you can see, especially for paraffin, it doesn't even take that much heat to melt it. And you, you guys, of course, know that uh, wax melts at very close to room temperature. Well, that's what paraffin is. Paraffin is wax, like you find in a candle. So because of that sea of electrons, metals are great conductors. And the reason why is because those electrons are delocalized. They're mobile. And so if those electrons have the ability to move around, they can conduct electricity very well. Also, they're very good conductors of heat. For ionic crystals, it's a different story, however, because those electrons are locked into place and they're not delocalized, they can't move around. Therefore, ionic crystals are very poor conductors of electricity and heat. However, we can uh, melt or liquefy these uh, ionic solids. Remember, I'll go back a couple slides, the heat involved for doing this is very tremendous. So if I were to heat one of these salts, let's say a sodium bromide, this third row, 
if I were to heat that salt to 747 degrees Celsius, I could make that salt melt. And once I have that salt melted, those charges that are locked in with the anions are then free to move. And once they're free to move, they can conduct. And so it's not appropriate to say ionic crystals can't conduct at all because they can, they just have to be liquefied first. Additionally, we could take these salts and dissolve them in water. And once we dissolve them in water, that also allows the ions to move around and allows them to conduct electricity. Whenever we have an ionic substance dissolved in water and it conducts electricity, we call that an electrolyte. So molecular and covalent substance across the board are typically poor conductors. However, again, just like I mentioned the network solids for covalently bonded substances like graphite, graphite is a great conductor of electricity because it's an exception to the rule. We don't have these discrete molecules. So a lot of people think that water is a good conductor, um, but it's actually not. The reason why um, water conducts electricity, why people get out of pools when there's a lightning storm, is not because of the water, but because of all of the stuff that's dissolved in the water. Remember, ionic substances, when they are dissolved, create electrolytes, which allow electricity to flow. And so if we have a bunch of stuff dissolved in that pool to make sure that it's not going to grow bacteria, uh, those salts, like the hypochlorite salts, uh, they will allow the water to conduct electricity. So um, as long as we have pure water, however, if I were to take some distilled water and try to test the conductivity of the distilled water, the conductivity would be extremely low. In terms of whether a substance is malleable, malleable or brittle, uh, we can look to the particulate structure. And so on the left, we see an undisturbed ionic crystal. You can see every positive is surrounded by negatives and every negative is surrounded by positives. So we have attraction holding that crystal together. However, if we were to apply an outside force, what can happen is along a plane, those particles can align such that positives are next to positives and negatives are next to negatives, and then we'll have repulsion. And so that's what allows the substance to become brittle or break apart, is that misalignment of those ions and then the resulting repulsion. If you look at the structure of a metal, however, due to the sea of electrons, electrons can kind of just move or squish out of the way, allowing the metal to deform instead of breaking apart like an ionic solid. And so we have terms like malleable and ductile to describe the properties of metals. Um, malleable means that we could deform it, quite literally, it could be able to be formed by a mallet. So you could dent it, bend it, deform it, flatten it. Um, that's what malleable means. Ductile is a very similar term. However, it's talking about the ability for a metal to be drawn into wires. Lastly, we have alloys. Like I said previously, uh, when we form metallic bonds, we're not actually forming a compound we're forming a mixture. And so an alloy is a mixture of elements that has metallic properties. Um, a lot of times, whenever we're mixing these, these elements, they're going to be usually metals. And that's what allows the overall alloy to have metallic properties. However, there are examples like steel where we are mixing metals with non-metals. But at the end of the day, if they're forming metallic properties because of the metallic bonding, we call it an alloy. So the properties of the alloys will differ based on the elements that they contain because we are not creating uh, new chemical bonds oftentimes these uh, starting substances can retain their properties not always however and so we have two different types of alloys that can form so on the left of this image we have a pure metal in the middle we have a substitutional alloy and on the right we have an interstitial alloy you'll see that the difference between a substitutional alloy and an interstitial alloy is that a substitutional alloy we have atoms of a different element coming in to replace the original atoms usually they're roughly the same size whereas an interstitial alloy we're not replacing or substituting the initial atoms instead we're taking smaller atoms and we're fitting them in the spaces in between so the small holes that form in a metallic crystal if there is a smaller atom that could fit in those spaces then it will uh, they will fit in those spaces and create an interstitial alloy. So an example of an interstitial alloy would be steel. Steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. So carbon being a much smaller atom, uh, carbon can be placed into those smaller holes between all the iron atoms to create that much stronger steel alloy. Um, a substitutional alloy, an example of that would be uh, bronze or brass, where we are combining um, the the elements of copper 
and zinc. And so copper and zinc are roughly the same size, so they're going to form a substitutional alloy. So here's a table of some common alloys. You can see the second row is brass. Uh, it's an alloy of copper and zinc. So again, those atoms, copper and zinc, are roughly the same atomic radius, so that forms an, uh, a substitutional alloy. Uh, bronze is a very similar alloy, but instead of just copper and zinc, we have a proportion of tin in there as well. I mentioned iron already. Iron is that fourth row down. Uh, we have iron and carbon. So carbon being the much smaller atom fits in the holes between the iron atoms. Um, there's a lot of different alloys created or used to create jewelry. Uh, such as gold, 10 karat, 12 karat, 14 karat, 18 karat gold, that the blank carat talks about the, the quality or the purity of the gold, where 24 karat is the purest, and so 12 karat would be 50% gold. Um, we could talk about sterling silver. Sterling silver is also used to make jewelry. It's 92.5% silver, but silver tarnishes very easily, so uh, it's also a little more malleable than one would like. And so what they do is they add copper in to strengthen it and prevent it from tarnishing as easily. So this is just a, a bunch of different alloys that apply to um, what we're talking about here. So that is just a brief lesson on types of bondings and properties of compounds.